You're listening to Radio Mayapur with the best devotional, meditation, kirtan music, and inspirational podcast. This is Radio Mayapur. <clears throat> okay, here we are in Christland, Christ Church. Sorry, we are in Christ Church today, and it's a beautiful sunny day. Windy. It's a little cold because we are in the end of the world and this place is becoming winter. In the other part of the hemisphere is becoming summer. So in India it's very hot, 35, 40 degrees. Europe, in Italy, I spoke with my friend Sergio yesterday. He told me the spring is coming, blooming, beautiful color, nice sky. And uh, so, but we are in New Zealand, a very beautiful place. And today we are very, very fortunate to be with the temple president of Christ Church Temple of Iskon. His name is Ramanuja Prabhu. I've been knowing him for many, many years, although I did not ever much associate closely to him, but I've seen him many times in Mayapur. He was born in Adelaide, in Australia. Uh, very, very uh, strange. He was born in my same birth date, 1-1-1957. <laughs> I'm also born according to my passport to that same <clears throat> time and he studied in Australia and he joined in 1979 he met devotees so welcome to our show Ramani <clears throat> Prabhu for Radio Mayapur we are doing this interview to inspire all the devotees who are listening to us around the world whether they're driving car or cleaning their kitchen or washing the dishes or cooking for the Lord this is an inspirational podcast by which we are entering deep into the life of the devotees. Because people meet you, they don't know your story, they don't know how in the world you come in contact with the devotees, how you, your life at a certain point change. So welcome, Ramanuja Prabhu. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. And uh, thank you for hosting us. <clears throat> Me and His Holiness Banu Maharaj, we are uh, traveling all around the world. You're giving us nice facility and nice prashadam, and nice opportunity to be in contact with devotee. Welcome once again. Thank you, Ikanga. And uh, so, I'll ask uh, just a few questions. One is that, how was your life before you met the devotees? Tell us a bit about your family, your childhood. Your father was in the army, you told me before. Yeah, and we grew up. My father was in the military. Nice. Uh, so, we constantly moved when we were children. I've got a brother who later joined the movement as well. I have a sister who later joined the movement also. Two other sisters who uh, didn't take an interest in Krishna consciousness. So when we were young, we moved around a lot. And uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but what was your father in the army? So we can understand why you were moving. Uh, yeah, well, my father was, he was in the military, but he was a musician. Oh, in the military. okay, okay. In Australia, each capital city right. has a brass band. Yeah, of course. And so there was, at, back, in the, back in the 60s, there was five big military bands in Australia. So he was, uh, eventually went on to become in charge of one of those, those bands. And on the weekend, he would play in a jazz band. Wow. What instrument did he play? Uh, in the military, he played yeah. a trombone, a, a trombone. euphonium, okay. and a trumpet. Wow. And he was well worse. He was a very accomplished musician. He'd write the scores for the band and everything. Beautiful. And on the weekend, for fun, he'd play in a jazz, jazz band. Jazz band. And he used wow. to play one of the big upright. <laughs> Oh, the base. Base. Yeah, Beautiful. So. And so from a young age, myself and my brother, we had a keen interest in music. music. And we used to play in a church band, the, the, whoop, 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 the trumpet and stuff, <laughs> yeah, myself nice. and my brother. And then later on, a little later on, when I was probably a young teenager, I picked up the electric bass. That's nice. And during school, and then when I left school, that's what I did for a living. I was in a band. Blues band? 
Yeah, rock and roll. Rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. rhythm yeah. and blues. The rhythm and blues. Are beautiful. Name. So that's that's what I was doing prior to joining. My mother, who was quite religious, my father had passed on by then. Uh, yeah. uh, a motorcycle accident. He was killed. And my mother was quite religious and she wasn't impressed with the fact that I was in a rock and roll band because we know back in those days the Hippie activities. Time. Yeah, it, it was a fairly unsavoury lifestyle, <laughs> quite the opposite of what we do now. Absolutely. But uh, I enjoyed it for some time and... We were making good money, very good money, which... Which is strange. At that time, you don't, I mean, if you're playing the band, you don't make so much money. Yeah, well... You were going we up. Were, yeah, we were in a mid-tier. What was but, the name of the band? Let us know. Uh, over the years, there was different names. Uh, okay. Jagged Edge, which Jagged came Edge. from the name of a Jimi Hendrix. Song. Right, right. Uh, later on, the band morphed into something different, and that was called uh, Eargasm. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So, but during this period, I had started to become a bit disillusioned with the the lifestyle, really. Not the music. Of course. I, I, it's like I had music in my blood. Yeah. But... I started, at the beginning of the night, you'd start playing, people would come in, and then by the end of the night, everybody was trashed. Yeah, whether it was drug or alcohol drug, or both, this and that. Everything. Yeah, everything. And yeah. it's like, and of course, we were playing, so we had to maintain some type of sobriety. Of course, yeah. we were doing what we of were course, doing. Of course, a little but bit. We had to keep it fairly straight to get Naturally, through the night. Definitely. But just watching. And I had a couple of friends. They didn't live with us, but I had a, a friend, a close friend I'd known for many years. She used to regularly visit the temple. And then she used to work in the restaurant doing the dishes. She was a junkie. She was a prostitute. But... She had some affection for the temple. Nice. And at the end of the night, when the restaurant was finished, she would bring, because she passed our house on her way home to her house, she would bring us prashadam regularly. Nice. And it was, at the time, the, the, the devotee in charge of that restaurant was Bhutanath, oh. well-known Australian yeah. chef, yeah. very well-known. And he was a, a wonderful cook. And so you start to prashad, take prashad. started to take prashad. And then, of course, at that time, there was the devotees were constantly in the street doing Harinam and mm. selling books. So you saw them, the devotees? I saw them. I would avoid them, of course. Of course, strange but people. A couple of times, uh, the book sales, and this was near the end of. Prabhupada's Leela, the book selling in Australia became very, very difficult. We had many devotees per head of population. I think at the time it was said per head of population, we had more devotees in Australia than any other country. <laughs> so it was a small population, a lot yeah, of, of devotees, course. and it was difficult to, to avoid. avoid them. <laughs> you meet them everywhere, yeah. in the airport, in so a restaurant, in supermarkets. I got a couple of books, and wow. the, the selling was... It was intense. They stick the book under your arm. Come on, and take this one. Give me a couple down. of bucks. But one small book I read, and I was, meanwhile, my friend Cheryl, they were hosting, not regularly, but probably fortnightly or every three weeks, she would have a program at her house on a Saturday night for blooped devotees. And you know, back in those days, a blooper yes. was almost an untouchable. It was yeah, nobody wanted to stay near yeah. them. Yeah. And so some of these, <clears throat> I started to attend that when I could, which wasn't that often because we were working Plain Saturday always. nights. Yeah. But they were nice devotees, real nice devotees. They were all probable disciples because yeah. 
it was it was back then. And they just weren't able to maintain the standard, living in the temple, yeah, as we know. It was intense in yeah. back then. So we should say you have to be fully committed and give your life to distribute books or whatever yes. preaching and it was intense yeah. and uh are in um, and there was not uh, a yeah. personal life. Yeah. There was no we downtime. Live, we we live in a temple I live yeah. in the temple of Brahmachari after Prabhupada yeah. left for yeah. ten years so and yeah. But was very blissful, I should it say. It was. So they were, they were kind to me. Yeah. And then this friend Cheryl, she prompted me, of, "Why don't you visit the temple?" The first time I went to the temple, it was, it was strange. Which place? It was Adelaide. Adelaide. I was back in Adelaide. Oh, okay, you were then. back in Adelaide. Yeah. But the the feasts were <laughs> phenomenal. And we had a reputation in Adelaide. Of course, every temple used to think they had the best feasts, but <laughs> we did have a reputation for extremely good feasts. There was always two or three subjects, two or three savouries, two or three sweets. It was phenomenal. So the prasadam I was attracted to, but when they would speak to me, yeah. uh, that's a bit weird. And then... One time, she invited myself and a friend of mine. They were having a fire sacrifice, mm -hmm. and it was a Sunday evening. And we right. were on the way back from the beach, and we thought, "Well, let's stop let's in, check get a out. feed, yeah." And they're having a sacrifice, and I, I had these images in my head. There was sacrifice. What are they well, doing? Is it? And the, the Adelaide Temple, when you went up the first flight of stairs on the first landing. There was this huge wall-sized painting, the Nishingadev painting with Haranya Kashi Poo on his lap. Ripping, ripping off his intestine. Oh. So I got halfway up and I, I <laughs> clearly remember thinking, this is going to be great. <laughs> sacrifice. A fire sacrifice. And we sat in and I was... A little disappointed because I was what there I was, thought no. it was going to be, <laughs> and gradually I used to go to the temple. More. It was probably over the course of two, two to two and a half years, and some of the the Bhutanath, the cook, was was very kind to me. He was a nice man, and another devotee there. Prabhupada disciple Pundarik, he was English. Mm. Pundarik yeah. still lives in Australia. Yeah. He joined. He he joined and was initiated by Prabhupada in Vrindavan. Wow. Nice. But he had left and rejoined and ended up in Adelaide. Nice. And he used to come to my house and and preach to you, preach to me, and say, you know, this lifestyle you're living. And then, at one point in time. Bhavananda was coming through, and the devotee said, why don't you come and, and meet him? Yeah. So what, what transpired then was I was taken in to meet Bhavananda, and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, Blame playing you. a band. He said, are you married? I said, no. And he goes, you know, you'll never be famous. I know some very <laughs> wealthy, famous musicians, and if you haven't done it by now, you won't be. So just give up and join the temple. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> what the, what the hey, preaching, man? <laughs> dude, that's, I just came to say hello. <laughs> and what he did, he said, just stay the weekend. See if you like it. Yeah. And if you don't, Monday morning, whoa. we'll drop you off at home. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm off to the airport Monday morning. We'll drop you at home. So he got a couple of the brahmacharis. One of them was Panjaratna, who still lives in yeah, Jaipur. Yeah, Panjaratna from Jaipur, yeah. I know. A couple of brahmacharis. Take him home, grab his things, and bring, and him, bring him back. And that was it. It was, <laughs> it was almost like a kidnap. <laughs> but you enjoy being in the temple, right? Yeah, because I... Like I said earlier, I was becoming disillusioned with the 
the lifestyle. Material world is punishing everybody. And I always had a... I always had a healthy disregard for authority. Yeah, of course. Because... You were just, a rebel. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I wasn't trying to be a rebel. No, no, but like no, at but school, you when I put my hand up and, and ask questions, <laughs> I was usually told to shut up. Of course. And I was like, why? Right. Why can't you just answer my questions? Absolutely. So, through reading, of course, and then being in the temple, everything, you know, Questions were answered. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I was satisfied with that and, yeah. and I stayed. There was a couple of times where I disappeared. Uh, you wanted to the, walk in about? The, in the first, <laughs> first couple of years because, yeah, myself and Pundrant and we were often in the desert. Okay. We were selling paintings by then. And we were in the in desert. Australia. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we'd be right in the middle. Nowhere. Big. Big cattle and sheep stations, yeah. thousands of kilometres from anywhere. anywhere. So I was still, I was still a very young devotee, and we were out there by ourselves, and we just made up at night. And one day I thought, I, I didn't join the temple to 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 be doing this. <laughs> and so I disappeared with the car. I came back to the temple a couple of weeks later. And then another time I had a friend that we grew up in the same street. His name's Lowy Tuxer now. Uh, he joined before me and he travelled through India before he joined. And he was living uh, up at New Govardhan, Brisbane. Mm -hmm. He said, Go across. Yeah, why don't you come up here? It's, it's much easier up here. Beautiful place. So... Again, I left the temple without permission. And back in those days, when you when you left without permission, you were persona non grata. Absolutely, you didn't do that. They didn't like you so much. So that that delayed me getting initiated oh. for a good couple of years because I was put in the, uh, the un the, unstable basket. Yeah, even though I wasn't. But <laughs> once I found my feet. That's, that's never looked back. Yeah. But I would like to say that maybe because your father trained you to always think, don't take things for granted, always question everything. Question everything. Because this is a nature of inquiring people. Yes. And people have vision, people have yeah. uh, going through discipline. They always, yes. I'm admiring your father. My yeah. father was the same. He said, hey, whatever you do. Yes, yeah. figure yeah. it out, probably use your brain yes. and just do things because people say. And my father, he wasn't a devotee, of course, and he was like a common layman, but he was actually very intelligent. He had a very inquiring mind. And he was, of yeah, he was, a, he was a thinker. Nice. And he used to tell myself and my brother, just put your hand up, question it. Because he used to say to us, they're full of garbage. And I was only 15 when he passed away, so I never got to spend in my real developing years quality time with him to, to pick his brains. And, yeah. What do you mean? What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing how this uh, father figure, grandfather, they have so much wiseness. Yes. I still remember today my grandfather telling me things, you know, yes. about life, which at the time leave really you shocked. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm 12 years old and he's telling me two things in life. I said, what? Don't run after money. Don't run after woman. I said, whoa, what is this? <laughs> and I was scratching my head. Why are you telling me this? He said, son, there are more women than men in the world. And whatever money you're supposed to get, the Lord will give it to you. Yeah. So, I mean, simple answer, but yeah. very wise. Yeah. So, these are things which you, in retrospect, you remember sometimes they pop in your head and say, yes. Wow, well, I bang my head on the wall. My grandfather told me that don't go that direction. And 
I remember reading a, an article in an older Back to Godhead mm. by the Fody in the US. I cannot remember his name, but he had left early in the piece and he'd been outside of Hiscon for two, two and a half decades, a long time. Yeah. And he'd come back. And because he was senior and he was a Prabhupada disciple, the younger devotees always came to him for naturally, advice. Naturally. And in this article, he was saying how he wished he had had more input when he was younger because he was viewed now as a wise old man. And he didn't consider himself to be a wise old man. And he was lamenting that yeah. he wasn't well-versed enough. Very interesting Very article. Because people people see us like that now. Yeah, we're getting <laughs> old, even though I feel I was like 20 years old when I joined, <laughs> but you know, the body's getting old. But Ramana Prabhu, then let our audience hear about the your program you're doing here in uh, Christchurch. You've been Temple President for a long time, and uh, I know you're doing a lot of programs, uh, outreach, yoga, studio, or this, that. Tell us a little bit about the life of as a Temple President. How many years are your Temple President now? Here. here, it's about 15, 16 years, yeah, so and it wasn't time, something... Eh? I wanted to no, do of course. Because, you know, I lived yeah. in India for many years. Yeah. And uh, we were working on Srila Prabhupada Samadhi in Mayapur for five years. I was years. there with you. Yeah. With the so that's, Kadamba Gana Maharaj at that time he was. After the upheavals of the mid-80s in Australia, there was, you know, it was worldwide. There was huge upheavals. At that time, Maha Shringa, Mahasringa Maharaj, Maharaj at the time. Yeah. He'd, he'd been coming through Australia. So it it got quite ugly at one point. A lot of people had left. And so he he said, he was based in Mayapur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, why don't you guys, you're on a sinking ship here. Yeah. Why don't you jump ship? Save the ship. So eventually... We did, and in 1987, myself and Panjaratna, we gave notice, we did the right thing. Yeah, of course. We went to the festival in 86 and said, look, that's it. here's <laughs> a year's notice, we're going to live in India. Yeah. No, you're not. Uh, we are. We are. <laughs> and the big stick's gone now. Yeah. <laughs> so we did, nice. and we were, we were there for five years. And during that time, I used to travel every six weeks or so to Makrana in Rajasthan for buying the marble. stone for the oh. yeah the red stone the, the white the marble stone. everything yeah. So to get to Makrana, you would we'd go to Vrindavan and then go through Jaipur, and I used to say to Panjaratna this. Jaipur is a nice place. There's nothing happening. Yeah, at the time there was no temple. So we, when we finished with Mayapur, the reasons for that won't go into. Okay. We we thought let's let's go to Jaipur, start the center, and start a center. So we ended up there, and there was just myself and Panjaratna. We had one grass mat each. And a one liter pot. We didn't have a cooker, but we had a one liter pot. And we were staying in cheap hotels for the first four or five months. And, you know, you could get a room for 15, 20 rupees. Yeah, it was cheap at the time. And we were using rickshaws. Not hotel, you stay in the Dharma Sala. That was different from hotel. <laughs> Correct? Yeah, there's some Dharma Sala, some hotels. Some hotels. Yeah. Because uh, a big tourist place, a lot, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, a lot, lot of cheap tourists, places. Yeah. And we met some life members who would then feed us. And we were given, at that time, Kadamba was then the temple president in Vrindavan. He gave us the life membership lists. Nice. So we were door knocking daily. But what had happened 
unbeknownst to us was that for nearly 20 years, the Life Membership boys from Bombay, they used Delhi, to come there and, make and life uh, where else, Vrindavan, <laughs> promised them the earth, <laughs> give them next to nothing, yeah, and go and run with the money. Yeah. So, the first 18 months in Jayapur, some ve- it's even some very nice people were like, Close get the lost, door. don't want to see your face. You, you guys are not trustworthy. But after the 18 months, Mark, we noticed a shift in people that, oh, they're not running away. They're still here. here. Yeah. And it's not the relationship. It became, yeah. So for the first three years, there was just the two of us. It was, it was good. You know, it was pioneering. It was preaching. It, it was India. Yeah. It was great. But then we started to, we got another devotee. And then another. Start to expand. Started to expand. And the, the fact that we just sat there yeah. all that time and Krishna was segregated. And you, you see it now. Beautiful. Beautiful temple, lots of devotees. Big congregation. Big and congregation. we have, I think, 12 or 13 centers in Rajasthan now. Yeah. And so during the course of that, Pantaratna married a local girl, and we had been together for a long time. In the Brahmajari Ashram yeah. in Australia, we travelled together on Sankatan. We went to India together, Prabhad Samadhi. Nice. We went to Jaipur together. So when he got married, I felt a bit... It's not that I had the urge to get married. I felt a bit isolated. You know, right. just Find yourself alone. <laughs> a, long way, a long way from home. Yeah, and alone. Uh, the dynamic changes because he had a wife. Of course. And he spent less time with me. So I ended up getting married. And the person I married had difficulty in India. And of course... Rajasthan, she was Australian. She's a Kiwi. Kiwi, okay. So, yeah, big harsh, jump. Su- harsh from, summers. Yeah. Uh, really a construction site, dusty as anything. She was the only Western woman there. Nobody Plus respected. Thousands of people. Yeah. And so it got tougher and tougher for her. So I had to make a decision either, <laughs> either move. Or leave her. Or leave her. And you we tried leave. the second option first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that didn't really work. And then on the advice of some senior devotees in Vrindavan, they said, well, deal with it now because you don't want that dragging you back in the future to, to deal with it in a future right. life. So I decided reluctantly to leave India and come here. And I've been stuck here since. (laughs) So when I arrived, the plan was to spend maybe six months here Mm -hmm. and then, you know, work on our relationship, go back to India. That was my plan. Krishna had a, Krishna and my wife had a different plan. (laughs) So I'm still here. Nice. So the preaching is going nicely here in Christchurch. Yeah, it's it's we're not. Well, you have a nice temple. Yeah, it, yeah. We so when I came here, we had a, a a different building, and the the management that was here at the time there was some difficulty, and the whole management team left, and they took the devotees with them. So you end up again being the only person. So Ramai Swami, you know, he rang me and said, well, they've just walked out. The building's open. The deities were. So I went around to have a look, secured the building. Right. And then Ramai Swami eventually said, well, can you you help out? Yeah, can you take Uh, care? Naturally. I was reluctant because I didn't come here to, to get into that. And then... 
six months later, it's like I was the TP. By default. By default, yeah. yes. And so we, the building, a beautiful old building, but it was run down. So then we set about renovating the building, which I think was a bit of a miracle itself because we had no money. The roof was leaking. Somehow we got a new roof. That was $40,000. And then we did the building up room by room. Beautiful building. And then in 2010, three years after I got here, there was the huge earthquakes. Oh, yeah. And it destroyed the building. Completely fall down? There, there was September 2010 that damaged the building, mm -hmm. not beyond repair, mm -hmm. but we were waiting for the insurance, the to loss of justice to come in and assess. See how much we And then in the meantime, in February, we had the real big one, whoosh, destroyed the destroyed building completely. totally. No one was hurt. No, Pajari was hurt. Uh, but not seriously, because okay. the deities flew off the altar. Wow. I mean, it, it was a violent earthquake. And the Shingasan was pushed off the altar into the middle of the temple room. Amazing. And Janava Mata, who lives in Dunedin, uh -huh. missed her by a fraction. Millimeters, missed her head. What a killed her. Amazing. So I, I, we own the property next door. I was in the property next door. I ran to the temple as it was imploding because it went for 25 seconds. So I managed to long. get to the temple. And it was destroyed. And the deities weren't, you know, it wasn't a broken arm or a broken leg. We were finding... Tiny, I, I got like a huge sack of tiny pieces of marble. Of marble. So initially, the GBC was like, "Well, can't you just put the deities back together?" There, were, yeah. there was other precedents. Yeah. And when I sent them photographs of, hmm. I've got thousands of chips here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you work it out. Sam Diddy. No. Oh, we, Diddy. we did the Visaga. Put okay. put you them put in the ocean. ocean. Nice. And then I thought, well, no point me being here anymore. There's no temple. So I was, I was making plans to go back to India. But the Lord, there's some other plan. <laughs> and then the my Swami asked, well, we're insured. Can you sh sort the insurance out? And I was like, that's, that's going to be messy. It's going to be messy because the whole city was destroyed, not just yeah. our temple. Not just you, thousands of yeah. people. But my wife at the time, who was an accountant, she was working for the church property trust. The Anglican church here is mm. quite strong. Right. In the city alone, they had four big cathedrals. So her, she, she was responsible for the, for those properties of the Anglican Church in right. this city, and there was there was many of them, but four big cathedrals in the city. So through her job, she was working directly at the coalface with the insurers who were based in Australia. Now she was under contract that she couldn't speak because this was naturally. Otherwise, a lot of people, a yeah. lot of people will come and get clean yeah. them. And after about probably one year of this, a year after the earthquake, she said to her boss, you know, <laughs> my husband is in charge of the Hare Krishna <laughs> temple. I'm doing this and I'm not allowed to. This. We, we can't sense. live like this. Yeah. <laughs> so her boss gave her, the CEO of the insurance, his card. He lived in Melbourne. I said, give him a call. So I rang him. And his name was Andrew, Andrew Moon. And he said, do I detect an accent? I said, yes, I'm from I'm Australia. Australia. <laughs> and the first thing he said to me was, who's your football team? 
And for 20, 25 minutes, we talked football, football. Aussie rules. Yeah, naturally. And it, it broke the ice. And I had some p people I grew up with who went on to be then professional footballers football who he knew because he lived in yeah, Melbourne course. and that's the, the headquarters. Nice. And probably after half an hour of this, he said, well, what can I do for you? I said, look, the Anglican Church has many properties. Even if they take a hit, they will be well reimbursed. We've got one. And this company was pulling out of the market because the losses were so big. Of course, big. they cannot be. Everybody. So I said, if you pull out, we've only got one, one church, so to speak. That's the end of us. We're finished. He said, call me back in three days. And I did. And he said, I've got some good news for you. Tomorrow morning, there'll be a check on your desk. <sighs> and the next morning, it was in our bank. It was a million dollars exactly. Not a lot of money, but it was a million bucks. Well, it was not. Yeah. I mean, it was and not nothing. It was the a following bucks. day, they pulled out of the New Zealand market. They were still meeting their obligations, but they were gone. So we it's got good. in got in by a day. Nice. So once we had the money, I thought, well, that's, they've got their money. I'm going. They can build a new <laughs> temple. Hasta la vista. I'm off to India. And I went to India. Okay. I told the devotees, you know, I've done my job, nice. done my duty, give you the box. And so I was in Jaipur for about four months. And later on, during that time, I was in Vrindavan and I met Burijan. We've known each other a long time and he invited me over for lunch. And he said, what are your plans? And I said, well, I think I'm back here now. And I said to him, what do you think I should do? And he said, I can't tell you what you should do, <laughs> but I think I know what Srila Prabhupada would well, say to yeah. you. And I said, okay. okay. <laughs> so it went like this. He said, I'm pretty sure Prabhupada would say to you, go back, build the temple. Then and then when you've done that, you can go where he wants. <laughs> and it made sense. Of course. Because, you know, I was involved in the Samadhi construction in Mayapur. You knew we were building the Jaipur temple at the time. So I'd had a lot of experience. So I came back and it took us nearly a couple of years to find the right architect Please. and engineer. And then March 2017, we finished this current this temple. This temple. Which is very nice. Yeah, so, and since then, I've been sort of planning to. <laughs> India's calling <can't> you. <laughs> but there's obligations, you know, because you got to make sure things of course, are a lot stable of things. before. Yeah. I think because you're from this area, you know, it's good for you understand the mentality of the people and you understand the mood mm -hmm. and you are. Uh, understand the government working. If anybody else come from any other part of the world, it will take me 10 years to figure out things, Could take you know? A bit. But, uh, but of course you're keeping Krishna in your heart, wherever you are, yeah. that's my work, Prabhuji. Yeah. You know, but we, our experiences in Bengal and then Rajasthan, you know, just strangers in a strange land. You are but the white Krishna, elephant. <laughs> but Krishna, Krishna facilities always. Yeah. Beautiful. So what are your future apart from running away from this place and go to India? Oh, Any other future plan for anything. the temple? Uh any new preaching or any new insight or restaurant? I don't know what. I know you're doing prashad in different places. So. Yeah, well, well we do have a cafe in the temple. You now. do. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's only a couple of days a week at the moment okay. because of manpower. And of course, the difficulty in this age is it's a temple, it's all great hustas, they all work. Yes, so, so less time limited. to dedicate. Yeah. Uh, 
and you know how that works. It's it's sure. often difficult to to yes. expand of course. with preaching. Of course, it's not impossible, of no. course, but it. But well, let's really say the times it. have changed. Now, there yeah. is not been many people all over the world that are traveling with Maharaj. There's no other temple apart from India where people come and say, okay, I want to join the temple. Yeah. You know, because people, let's say, most of the people we are preaching, they are already grias, they are already working. And the young people, they are either too rara or study or yeah. getting a job. So there are very few people. Yeah. I say, in India, we still make a lot of brahmacharya. Yes. In Mayapur, we have... 350 brahmachari. Yeah. So all over India, we're still making brahmachari because it's a thick population. Yeah. And also because it's a culture. Yes. Like becoming a sadhu is yes. a culture. Yeah. Uh, like in Thailand, you know, there are so many people becoming monks. Yeah. So similarly in India, culture. the culture is to be yeah. part of uh, a religious organization, yeah. learn discipline, you know, and everything. So but apart from that, I see the whole world is changing the strategy yes. of preaching to <clears throat> Griasa means family member, people who are already settled in society. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say, okay, leave your family and come and join the temple. I mean, yeah. that, nobody will do that and yeah. think you're crazy. Yes. So obviously, our is becoming congregation. It's this congregation. Am I correct in my assessment? Yes. Yeah, I've noticed that over many yeah. years. Yeah. And then the difficulty, at least I find, and I don't think I'm unique, is that 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 really distorts the authority structure when it's congregational like yeah, that. Yeah. People get initiated. Sure. They see their guru as the authority. Sure. And oftentimes the local <coughs> authority is... Well, you know, we had to make... Uh, my understanding is that we had to empower people to preach, number one, but yeah. we had to make people responsible and uh, yeah. see how you are part of this uh, community, you yes. know? Maybe you initiated by any guru, we get that under the guru will yeah. be in the future. But Prabhupada is the founder of Acharya. We are following his instruction. And guru. you are living here. So, yeah, your guru will not tell you go to, you know, I don't know, Japan and preach there. You, know, <laughs> you are here. Yeah, your guru is your guru, is representing your Prabhupada. Yes. But we are working here in relation <clears throat> so we can uh, achieve something. Yes. So. And if we empower the devotee, and we recognize them, that they are the mm. people. Because many times, His Holiness Banu Maharaj say, okay, before you are initiated, somebody's training you for one year to chant 60 rounds. Yes. Those devotees, most probably the temple president, and, and they are the guru, because you are the one who gives knowledge, train them to be mm. on a platform of steady devotion of service. So we sure. should recognize all these devotees. Yeah. And uh, we should not minimize them. Uh, like, uh, yeah. okay, now I'm your new authority. Don't listen to anybody else. So it doesn't work in that way. Yeah. And therefore, I mean, we are going to a phase where yeah, people correct. are becoming aware. Yeah. So things, movement means we are moving. Yes. We are constantly moving. Yeah. We are not stagnating ourselves. So we yeah. are moving towards achieving uh, the desired result of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu dream. Right. Which is to spread the only name all over the world. And we had and to adopt gonna, and we had to be flexible. But they were going to empower people. That yeah. was his push. Yeah. So. Amata. I love you, Ramanujya Prabhu. I can talk to you for many, many hours. Now, there is any party message you would like to do, give to the Radio Mayapur who are listening to your uh, podcast today? Uh, Something important which can upgrade their spiritual life. Well, for myself, I I joined the movement because the people preaching to me right. were disciples of Prabhupada. Yes. The books I was given were Prabhupada's books. Yes. And so I think I was lucky in that from the beginning my heart was given over to Prabhupada and I've never lost sight of that through the the ups and downs and absolutely and it's the thing that's kept me it's the single thing that's kept me here yeah i've a couple of close friends of course the punjratna and jaipur and mahasringa while he was still here but ultimately probably i've never lost sight of without that mercy of srila Prabhupada, i wouldn't be here 
and Absolutely. I wouldn't have remained here. Absolutely. And so I think it's it's important that we develop that that attachment first and foremost for Srila Prabhupada above all else. Yes, nice. That means read Prabhupada's book. Yes. Listen to Prabhupada's book. Now they are available on audio format yeah. through Bhattivedanta Vedya Library. Yes. You can hear all Srila Prabhupada's books. Yeah. And so Kirtaniya Sadari, expose your consciousness to higher dimension by listening to music, yeah. bhajan, kirtan, lecture, and, and every we, moment of your life is worth I engaging read, in this. I'm guilty of not reading every day, but I read most days. Nice. But at least at night time, when I go to bed, I put Srila Prabhupada on, the speakers under my nice. pillow, nice. and I get six or seven hours even though I fall asleep, but see, probably yeah, is here. pushed into my mind seven nights yeah. a week. And, and, and he's been doing that for decades. Nice. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a big, great pleasure to meet you and speak to you and, and get in a glimpse of your life. And I'm sure that everybody will be inspired. And thank you. I remember the first time we met when uh, we were off to Bangalore, I think it was, for, for meetings, ICC meetings, and you were the temple president in what was then called Madras. Correct, in Chennai. <laughs> we stayed there for a day or two. Okay. And the old the little, yeah, I think building. it was blue, was it blue or green? Yeah, grey or blue, I don't remember. Blue. Was in Kilpa, which year it was? Yes. Yeah. Was it Kilpa Garden Road? Yeah, it was. Yes. And then he dropped us at the station and nice. off we went. I, I, I <laughs> vividly remember that. So thank you once again. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Nanta Kodi Vaishnavrinda ki jai. Arivo. Thank you. Shila Prabhupada. You're listening to Radio Mayapur with the best devotional, meditation, kirtan music, and inspirational podcast. This is Radio Mayapur.